How would I pray? Gracious Lord, thank you for this chance to meet today as your people. Thank you for your word and thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to see him more clearly, love him more dearly, follow him more nearly. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, some of you also may know this, but over the last couple of weeks, I've started our new job, working for our funeral director. It's not the most pleasant of jobs. It's a bit of alternate ministry experience for me as I learn how people grieve and prepare for those last moments of their life. It's also a bit of cash over the holidays, and it's been really eye-opening. And if I'm not, like, being honest, I'm not quite sure how I'm coping. If you ask Chantel, I'm not the most emotionally stable of people in situations like that. But it has been really eye-opening for me. And between all the logistics that go into preparing a body for funeral, as I've walked through rows of graveyards, trudging through mud, bearing the weight of someone's loved one to commit them to the grave... There has been one image, one image alone that I've seen more than any other, and I'm sure you have seen too, and that is the cross, the cross. Crosses lined across grass fields, towering over chapels, wedged firmly into the hands of statues and the picture of saints. At a graveyard, you cannot escape The cross. And as Christians too, it goes without saying, which is why it needs to be said, that the cross is at the heart of our faith. And whether you are someone trying to understand the Christian message for the first time, or whether you have been a Christian of some devotion for many years now, You will not make much progress in your faith unless you grow in your understanding of the cross of Christ. We too cannot escape the cross. But if you listen carefully to our reading just now from John's Gospel, you wouldn't have noticed any mention of the cross. However, at this pivotal point, about halfway through John's Gospel, looking back over all that he has taught and all the signs that he has performed to reveal his glory, Jesus now looks forward to his death and resurrection. And he chooses at this point to use a stunning act of humility to teach us about the cross. About what it reveals, what it achieves, and what it requires. What it reveals, what it achieves, and what it requires. My apologies at this point. Uh, I've changed the outline of this talk to the three headings. If you're following on the bulletin, I'm not sure if you might have got it. Apologies, I should have had slides, but... Every time I talk to Marty the week before my sermon, I seem to always end up rewriting it the day before. So, (laughs) uh, I apologize. What it reveals, what it achieves, and what it requires. But before I continue, why might I think Jesus' act of foot washing is about the cross? A deliberate parable, a symbolic act or window into the meaning of the significance of his death. Why might I think that? There are three clues in this passage. In reverse order, we have verse 7. Marty might be able to get that up on the screen for us. Jesus says to Peter, You do not understand what I am doing, but you will later. By later, he means after the cross. After his death and resurrection, you will understand this, Peter. Perhaps... This is when Jesus singles out Peter when he fishes on the shore of Galilee after his resurrection and asks him those three painful questions. Peter, do you love me? 
Secondly, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus says, it is not yet my hour, my hour. But now in verse 1, Jesus knew that the hour had come, the time for him to leave this world and go to the Father, which means, of course, the hour for him to fulfill his mission and give his life on the cross. Third clue, it's the Passover. It's the season for the lambs to be sacrificed in memory of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt in the time of Exodus. And at the beginning of the gospel, we have already heard John the Baptist cry out about his cousin. Before, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Three clues that the foot washing episode here in John's gospel is a window into the meaning and significance of the death of Jesus on the cross. So if that's the case, what do we learn about the cross from this episode? What it reveals, what it achieves, and what it requires. Firstly, what it reveals. Sovereign love and human need. Sovereign love and human need. At the heart of this passage is the stunning humility of Jesus. Have a look with me at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so, what? What does he do? Jesus knew that he had been given all power. Can you imagine what having all the power in the world would feel like over sun and moon and stars Nations and rulers and governments, angels and demons, birth and death, life and judgment. What would you do if you had all of that power? As God, the Son of God in flesh, Jesus knew that all things had been put under his power. And so, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of his disciples, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus knew that God had put everything under his feet, and so he got up, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. Then, as now, stunning power and stunning humility do not usually go hand in hand. And this is certainly not true of foot washing. The washing of feet, if you know anything about it, in the ancient world was a common and necessary thing, but a rather distasteful job. When Jesus dons the towel around his waist and kneels to take hold of their dusty, dirty, disgusting feet, he takes the role of of a slave, a servant poised to perform the most menial of tasks. However, Jesus knows, and they too will know one day, that to rub one's fingers through the callous toes of a working class fisherman and perform this most basic of tasks, that it would very shortly appear as nothing, nothing compared to the ridicule and torture of Jesus on the cross. Gasping for breath, nails in hand and feet, as he dies the humiliating death of a criminal. Jesus knew that God had put everything under his feet, and so he got up, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. John prepares us for this moment with the words at the end of verse 1. Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. You see, the foot washing and the death it foreshadows was not just an act of stunning humility. It was much more than that. It was an act of sovereign love. Sovereign love. 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That oh so little but momentous phrase, loved him to love them to the end. To the end. It, that phrase makes this statement a summary, not just of the foot washing, but of all that will now unfold in John's gospel. It sets in motion everything that's about to happen as the pace of the narrative speeds up towards the cross. His farewell discourse, his betrayal, his tear-soaked prayers in Gethsemane, his trial, his torture, his crown of thorns, and that most humiliating of deaths, crucifixion. Jesus did it all because of love. And it is sovereign love. Sovereign love because Jesus knows. He knows that this is what must happen. Like a father who in that split second knows what he must do when his toddler walks out onto the road. Jesus knows that this is what must happen. He's not taken by surprise. Nor is he the unsuspecting victim of a shrewd plot. We are told that Jesus knows. He knows what must happen to fulfill his mission to love and die for the sins of the world. He knows the why, but he even knows the how. In verse 11, he knows who was going to betray him. Judas, one of his trusted 12, about whom we are told in verse 2 that Satan had already prompted to betray him. Here in John's Gospel marks the point at which we see the powers of darkness and human sin come together and contrive to kill the Son of God, to rear their ugly head and murder the light of the world. Evil is crouching at his doorstep. The ancient serpent is ready to strike his heel. But Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Next to what's about to become his cosmic display of divine and eternal love will be the display and the humiliation of all that went wrong in this world and in the human heart. Jesus knows. He knows about the power of sin and death that holds all people, including us, captive. Even us who read here John's Gospel, he knows that it affects us too. But Jesus knows that it must run its course for him to achieve his mission. And so the foot washing points not only to how Jesus's death reveals his sovereign love but also our human need our human need you see jesus intends to teach that it is not just our physical bodies that need to be washed but our hearts too as he says elsewhere out of the heart comes evil thoughts murder adultery lust envy theft Lies, slander, sexual immorality, blasphemy. It is the greed, malice and envy of all people like Judas, who we see here in this story, that Christ died for. For people who, like Judas and like us, will betray their Lord and maker in a heartbeat when a better offer comes their way or when we are pressured by the world around us. People like us who will succumb to the root of all evil, the love of money, and worship it rather than its giver. It is the defiant pride that Jesus dies for, which is evident in people like Peter, his closest of disciples. A pride that we see in Peter, revolt in disgust at the thought of his master washing his feet and goes even further, persisting in his arrogance when he asks for Jesus to wash his head and his hands as well as though to seem more loyal than his comrades around him 
who are getting the same treatment. It's this kind of ignorance and unbelief that pervades the whole first half of John's gospel and it pervades our time as well. Time and time again, Jesus revealed his glory by the signs and wonders he performed and which we read about in the scriptures, only to be met by stubborn unbelief. But Jesus knows. He knows that we are weak. Jesus goes to the cross, not because he sees our potential, but because he sees our need. And he is filled with love. Love. Jesus goes to the cross, not simply to demonstrate his love, but to expose the darkness of every human heart that we need to acknowledge before his sovereign rule over our lives. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so, and so, he got up, wrapped a towel around his waist and began to wash the feet of his disciples. The foot washing speaks of what the cross reveals. Sovereign love human need. Secondly, what the cross achieves. Washing from sin. Washing from sin. Look at the exchange between Jesus and Peter in verse 6. Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Simon Peter is shocked, as no doubt, as no doubt all of his disciples were. Foot washing was the most disgraceful and humiliating work. To see whom they regarded as the Messiah take on such a role would have caused utter dismay perhaps even offence. We may resonate with this as we think, uh, if you've ever had a guest over and they start to do the washing for you or do something that you feel like you should do. In this story, it looks like they partake in the shame of their master, audacious to break the code of hospitality and expose their own negligence to have not offered such a service. When reading the original language, I, I do know a bit of Greek, uh, the words of Peter when he says, are you going to wash my feet, sound almost unintelligible. They're like, you might wash my feet? doesn't come across as well. He is absolutely God-smacked. Jesus says that Peter will not understand until later. What Peter doesn't know is that this act of foot washing is only a preview. It's only a preview of what he will do on the cross. He has no idea. Because, friends, his death on the cross was an ignoble death, just as foot washing was an ignoble task. The one who died was the author of life, the author of life, just as the one who stooped to clean his grubby feet was the one without stain or blemish. On the cross, God, the Son of God, gave his life as a ransom for many, just as kneeling on the floor, the Lord and Master of all things made himself the servant of many. He was washing away their sin. And even as he humbly takes the form of a slave, so willingly he takes the place of sinners on the cross. Washing for sin. In this moment, he bends and takes in his hand the dirty, calloused feet of his friends. 
they feel the firmness of his grip and the thoroughness of his care. Yet before long, those hands will be stretched upon rough beams, laid out and pierced, and dust that formed that watching crowd will take the blood of Jesus. Little do they know. That humble night, with his blood, he washed away the grime of the day. And in his death, he will wash away the death of the, the sin of the ages. He laid aside his robe to clothe himself in garments of service. Later, he will be stripped of his robe and clothed in garments of mockery, a crown of thorn placed on his head, and the king will lay down his life for his enemies. What the foot washing teaches is that Jesus' death on the cross is a washing, a cleansing away of sin that these disciples have no idea about. No, Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. Never. But Jesus responds, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Peter is exuberant in his response. Then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus responds patiently, teaching. Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. Jesus teaches two things in this reply. First, that the cross is essential. It is essential for Peter. Unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. Friends, without the cross, there is no salvation for Christians. Jesus does not save us by simply teaching us God's wisdom, though he does teach us God's wisdom. He does not save us by being an example, though he is an example, as he is just about to say. He does not save us by being just a kind of role model or inspiration, though he has been a role model in inspiration for many throughout history. No, we are washed if we are to have a part with him. We must be washed. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And we must accept that. We must acknowledge our guilt and our sin before him. And he will wash us. It is essential. It is also effective. A person who has had a bath need only wash his feet, Jesus says. His whole body is clean. Now, Jesus at this point has changed the way he used, uses the metaphor. His point is that his sacrifice is not about physical washing, but spiritual. And it's once for all. We return to the cross again and again to remind ourselves of our sin and his love. But his death was once and for all. Though we may go on sinning again and again, his death was once and for all, and it washed away all of our sin if we put our faith in him. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Paul says. We are not under wrath, but under grace. Though we may die, death will not hold us. We have been washed in the sufficient, effective, and once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus. That cross, those crosses that mark your grave one day, which I see day by day now, will one day mark the place of your resurrection if you place your faith in him. What the cross reveals, sovereign love and human need, what the cross achieves... Washing from sin, essential and effective. And lastly, what the cross requires. What the cross requires. Loving service towards others. Loving service towards others. Look with me at verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. 
I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. What does Jesus mean when he says that you are to wash one another's feet? At once he is able to speak of the unique and essential work of the cross with this metaphor. But now he is able to talk about the way the cross is to shape the life of all his followers throughout their whole life. He does not mean that we are able to atone for the sins of others. He means that we must serve each other in the same way that his love motivated his foot washing and death on the cross. Christ's love compels us, for we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. We cannot do what he was sent to do, save us from sin if we cannot save ourselves how could we save others but we must do what he sent us to do serve others in his love he was sent to die on the cross we are sent to serve under the cross well thinking more practically as we finish up there are many obstacles to christians being servants aren't there of one another. Many obstacles that I'm sure many of you experience and feel. There is the pride in all our hearts, for a start. I'm too wealthy, powerful, important, educated, busy to serve others, especially some people. The pride that says, it's, it's not my responsibility, someone else will do it. I should be served, not be the servant of others. There is pride that cannot imagine something more humiliating or demeaning as foot washing, let alone crucifixion. And because we do not have the ability to empathise with Christ's love displayed on the cross, our hearts become hard and it prevents us from ever considering the act of service that God may lay before us. pride we may also be too busy too busy we think of church as an event and not a community we think of the people we meet here as the people who just happen to go to the same building rather than brothers and sisters in christ with whom we shall share eternity with and whom god has made us in some ways responsible for we think that the rest of our lives is more important I think we rightly feel a responsibility to people like mission partners, brothers and sisters who live far away, family, friends, especially if they live in circumstances far more difficult than ours. Yet God has placed us here next to each other with a bond that transcends all human relations. One of my deepest struggles has been over the last couple of years as a student minister, learning how to love and serve you without being a part of the community and living up here and the knowledge that my time here is only temporary. COVID and moving to Croydon has made it even harder. And yet I continue to feel deeply moved by Christ's model here of humble service. I'm sorry if I've ever come across as um, defensive or like I don't have the time. I find it hard to commend this to you all (laughs) when I know my situation has felt more like a balancing act of commitment than Christ's model of service. Boundaries are important to us all. We all have the responsibilities God gave us. And I imagine my struggle is no different from any one of you. And yet we are called, come what may, and in whatever way we can, to serve one another. 
how are you doing that here at Waitara? In the people God has placed in your life. Many come to church to experience that love of God in his people because they have nowhere else to experience that. And maybe the reason we find it so difficult to serve is because we think of church as an experience of spiritual consumption rather than spiritual collaboration. We are more inclined to look for a church that provides the things we are looking for in church rather than to look for the thing that we can contribute to in church. It makes sense. It's no surprise. The world trains us to think in terms of consumption. We are consumers of food, clothing and housing. We spend so much time looking for the thing that pleases us at the most pleasing price. But friends, the reason why we are so wedded to this drug of consumption, in my opinion, is because it is a substitute for power. Being able to choose between this and that option gives us a sense of power when little else in our life is going our way. We feel like we want anything we want in every area of our lives Because really, in every area of our life, we see the change and the decay of life, the sin that corrupts it all, the tragedies that face us. Life is like a fleeting flower, Jesus says, here today and gone tomorrow. And yet we cling to power through our consumption in our modern Western world. Consumption is power, we're told. And yet this is precisely why Jesus' example and teaching is so confronting. Jesus knew that God had put everything under his power. And with that power, he got up, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. He chose to serve and not to consume. Real power serves, real freedom serves, real Christianity as opposed to consumer Christianity serves. And friends, it has been so encouraging over my time to see so many examples of service in this church. Musicians, morning tea, volunteers, Bible study leaders, Sunday school leaders, warders, wardens, preachers, secretaries and treasurers people willing to be trained in evangelism, offer their time at Hornsby Westfield for Anglicare's Toys and Tucker, people using their professions to help those in need. And there seems always someone who is willing to have you over for morning tea for church, after church, or lunch throughout the week, should you be around. I remember last year, I, I, I always struggled to get my college work done. Um, between morning service and evening service uh, because there was always someone who would tempt me with lunch. But I do not want to say that you only have to be on a roster to be a servant. Being prayerful for one another, listening with interest and consideration as you come to church, offering hospitality with one another, reading the Bible with one another person or a group, encouraging at each other at every stage of life, whether it be in the struggles of parenthood, work, looking after a sick loved one, or in your own health. God has placed us here together together, to be a servant. And it takes time. It can take time. Patient listening, prayerful conversation, mutual encouragement and care in this way We wash the feet of our brothers and sisters. We bear each other's burdens and we enable one another with Christ's help to persevere to the end. And I'll finish by saying this. There's one last challenge to us all. That we who are wealthy and free, and I include myself in this, I stand up here with Aaron Williams, $600 pair Aaron Williams and a Gosman jacket. Um, We have what we have been given by God 
so that we may provide for the needs of others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ who do not have this. Let me encourage you to take seriously the call to be a Christian foot washer of all the Christian poor in this world. It is so important and it reveals Christ to this world. To summarise, what the cross reveals, sovereign love and human need. What the cross achieves, washing from sin, essential and effective. What the cross requires, loving service of one another. Knowing that the Lord had put all things under his power, he got up, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. Jesus said, unless you let me wash you, you have no part in me. And I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Amen.